Good morning again, everyone, or good afternoon, or whatever time of the day it might be for you today. Um, welcome back to our uh, Cerebral Blood Flow virtual seminar series. Uh, we're all pleased to see you today. We have about 104 people sitting in here in the, in the room so far. Um, so we're really excited to have this uh, second session starting today. Um, so uh, just some rules for the road again, um, as with last week, um, we'll have uh, Patrice Brassard will be our, our keynote speaker this morning. Uh, focusing his talk on cerebral blood flow regulation during high intensity interval training. And that will be followed by four abstract talks from some great trainees um, today. Um, I would like you to keep your microphone and video, um, um, uh, your microphone on mute and your video turned off uh, for the entire session. Um, we have a slight change in the terms of uh, managing questions today. Um, you can, at the end of the presentation, you can either post your question in the chat box or you could raise your hand, uh, which is actually a feature in the chat. Um, I think it's in the, in the chat um, option. Uh, so um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and we'll manage those um, um, as we go through. So you can actually then ask your question verbally rather than through writing. So it's up to you how you'd like to ask those questions. Um, so we'll manage those at the end of each, each uh, presentation and then we'll move on to the next one. So. Um, so I'm very pleased to uh, um, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Patrice Brassard for the first talk this morning, as I say, focused on brain blood flow regulation during high intensity interval training. So thanks so much, Pat. Thank you. Everybody's hearing me? Yep. So, so I will just... Uh... Super. So thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, welcome again uh, to our seminar series. I'm really excited to uh, about this uh, about this seminar, uh, which will be about exercise and cerebral blood flow. Should we hit our brain? Well, uh, considering like the the positive in, in, of information regarding the uh, the impact of uh, or yeah, what's going on in the brain or specifically in brain, uh, regarding brain vessels in response to high intensity uh, exercise training. I have a slightly different approach for this talk compared to Carolyn's uh, keynote talk from uh, last week. So the, my goal is pretty simple. It will be to set the stage to those, uh, to those guys who will have like a very interesting uh, talk for you uh, after mine. So first, I will focus on a few things about the risk uh, related to high intensity exercise, but don't get me wrong. I'm an exercise physiologist, so uh, I know that exercise is the best pill uh, on the market. Whether it is for uh, skeletal muscle function, the cardiovascular uh, function, and of course, uh, the brain structure and function, whether it is uh, via uh, direct impact on, of, of sheer stress and, 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 and related signaling, neural activation, or indirectly via systemic cardiovascular system, regular exercise is associated with numerous uh, beneficial adaptations. One way to reach, uh, to, 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 to induce those beneficial adaptations is through, through a high intensity exercise training, which is very popular, but not new, as we can see here. Uh, it has been really, or the popularity of uh, HIT as is now wider in, in, in several clinical population, but uh, as, uh, as um, around eight, the 1850s and post 1945, people were already using high intensity exercise for their respective training. And when you look at research wise, scientific wise, you can see the important number of publications in the last, let's say 15 years. And we, for those outside the field of high intensity exercise training, even, even as me, we can think that there is only, or it's only for athletes, but it's also very popular uh, in clinical populations, in cardiac rehab, in stroke rehab. We have a lot of uh, clinical population, a lot of patients who are performing high intensity uh, interval training. We have a few examples here, female cancer survivors, a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes, heart transplant patients, heart failure, cardiac uh, CAD patients, et cetera, et cetera. 
also when we are not necessarily in the field we can think of high intensity interval training as as only wind gates uh, all out um, exercise um, six as 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 we can see here like super maximal interval training six for 30 seconds all out on, on on bike essentially with separated by active recovery that's been popularized in the late uh, around 2010 from uh, uh, Gibella's team just uh, focused on that type of training uh, and um, and, and suggested that it was very interesting in terms of uh, adaptations through uh, while doing less exercise in terms of time commitment. However, it's not necessarily uh, feasible for all patients to do that kind of, uh, of HIIT training. So Scandinavian um, scientists have developed like a more clinical HIIT where we have the, four, the famous four by four model, for four minutes of intervals at uh, heart rate uh, at maximal heart rate around 85 to 95 percent with again active recovery three times per week and when we compare that to the moderate intensity aerobic exercise which is like the blue uh, spot here in terms of adaptation reduction in blood pressure improvement in, 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 in blood glucose improvement in aerobic capacities it's generally higher following high, high intensity interval training compared to the more traditional MICT Another question is, well, if, if popular clinical population starts to doing it is, it, is it safe? Well, when we, a lot of those uh, safety related uh, studies are focused on the cardiovascular uh, function and one of the latest um, systemic review uh, suggested it. So they reviewed 23 studies, you know, including a little bit more than 1000 participants and overall, they, they have shown that, uh, that there is a relatively low rate of major adverse uh, cardiovascular events in CAD patients. You also have a recent point of view who, who look at uh, small studies in, in, in the stroke rehab world and preliminary evidence from those 10 studies. So suggest that yes, adapt, like beneficial adaptations in terms of functional cardiovascular and no, vascular, and no plastic outcomes, but of course, larger randomized control trial trials are necessary, especially for effectiveness and safety of uh, that type of, of, uh, of training. Also, you have here you don't need to read everything. What I wanted to, to say uh, with the following two slides is that oh, if the, the recent literature also focused on trying to uh, develop guidelines for just the delivery and monitoring of it in these patients. And it's around that four by four uh, model. And in terms of monitoring, it's essentially regarding height, high, uh, heart rate zone and uh, rate of perceived uh, exertion. But we don't necess necessarily have a lot more information about guidance into uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring. And uh, of course, when you think about clinical populations, you have some clinical consideration in terms of uh, delivery and monitoring. And you have a bunch of absolute contraindication. So it's not everybody who can necessarily do uh, that kind of specific training. But again, you don't have a lot of information about like the second floor where uh, something could eventually happen if it's not necessarily well prescribed. So when I see reviews like this from, from a colleague in Montreal who said, well, based on what we know, we should prescribe uh, HIIT training to uh, every patient who enter cardiac rehab. Uh, after a few years studying cerebrovascular physio uh, physiology, I would say, well, before changing the guidelines, I would really like to further know the implications of HIIT for cerebrovascular health, acutely and, of course, uh, chronically. Because uh, we had the occasion to, at, at two different, uh, with two different publications, to review the literature. So here I just send you back the, the increased popularity of uh, studying HIT for different uh, uh, body functions. But in terms of cerebrovascular function in 2015, there, there were no studies examining the impact of HIT on cerebral vasculature, even not cerebral blood flow at rest. And we, you think that, well, maybe in five years, uh, a lot more information would be available, but we also had the occasion to recently uh, publish that um, like uh, updated review and only two studies 
small studies look at uh, the impact of hit few weeks of hit on uh, different uh, uh, parameters or mechanism related to the cerebrovascular function. We have those two papers here. This is, to our knowledge, what exists uh, about the impact of HIT on cerebrovascular function, a small pilot study in breast cancer survivors. And uh, so it was 12 weeks of HIT, of HIT focusing on, on cognitive function. And we looked also six weeks of HIT on, in, in athletes. Uh, and we look at uh, cerebral, cerebral blood, resting cerebral blood velocity and dynamic cerebral autoregulation. But I won't um, uh, enter into too much detail because it will be Alison's job where she will talk about a lot about the, the, the main studies uh, about the acute and chronic ic on cerebrovascular function in her systematic uh, review. Still, uh, even if we don't have a lot of literature uh, on that matter, we have to remember, because we have case report, even it's not in the scientific literature, suggesting that high intensity exercise is not risk-free. We have that uh, BBC presenter who um, was a regular rower, uh, was doing um, row, uh, exercise, high intensity exercise on, her, on his rowing machine, had a stroke, and at some point claimed that it was because of it. Uh, again, without any specific result, any specific information about uh, the, the, the potential impact and risk of cerebrovascular or of hit on cerebrovascular function, we only have that kind of case report uh, to share and, and, and move forward with. Even if it was not high, like high intensity, in, intensity intervals, we published that case report where in, an athlete with a history of uh, a, a, of uh, syncope and post-concussion syndrome um, develop or lost consciousness during a maximal exercise uh, with e experiencing succession of convulsion awakening periods with tonic-clonic movements. So she, 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 she was fine a few hours and a few days uh, after, after that. But again, with that kind of, of case report, we, we need to keep that in mind that high intensity is not risk-free. And again, I'm not against doing that kind of exercise, but um, um, I would need to, to prescribe this, this, uh, this uh, type of exercise pretty well, especially with, uh, with specific type of patients. So overall, uh, does HIT pose a danger to the brain? When you look at, again, not a lot of information out there. When you look at people who look, or, or researchers who look at safety issues in patients with cardiovascular uh, related problems. Well, they did their job pretty well. So they focused on animal model, then switched to healthy subjects. And it's after that, that uh, after looking at safety and healthy subjects, look at disease and clinical populations. However, patients with brain-related pathologies has already begun to use these type of protocol, despite a lack of evidence of uh, its uh, cere cerebrovascular efficacy. Of course, when you have some people who published uh, preliminary reports and looking at uh, whether there were adverse cerebrovascular adverse events uh, during that kind of uh, hit exercise in stroke rehab and with or following two, hour, two hours, uh, 240, 94 hours in 41 stroke patients, th those guys didn't uh, report any uh, uh, adverse events. However, there, for sure, there, there are too few studies to make firm confirmation supporting implementation of HIT in stroke rehab and other brain-related uh, pathologies. So I will move to, well, the, 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 the blood pressure changes related to HIT. Of course, when you think of oscillatory uh, blood pressure, these, these interval in blood pressure, these, interval, these intervals in, in blood flow, this will definitely lead to beneficial adaptator, adaptations in terms of shear stress, uh, uh, like mechanism related to mechanical transduction, et cetera, et cetera. So, of course, I'm, I'm, I will focus on, 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 on the safety issue, but we need to keep in mind that the same change in blood pressure could lead to beneficial adaptations. However, for, se for specific patients, this could eventually be uh, risky, uh, like that same quick increase in, in, in or the quick change in blood pressure. So I will just walk through that. 
So I will just focus on three specific um, mechanisms that could lead to neuroprotection uh, or will lead to neuroprotection in response to that kind of exercise and with a little bit of context with in, in patients with altered uh, mechanism that we'll, I will talk about. So in terms of blood pressure, we could say, well, um, the, the brain will be okay with that quick changes blood pressure because we have cerebral autoregulation. But we have to remember that when we move from that steady state changes in, 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 in blood pressure and to quick changes in blood pressure, and we look at the first few seconds, uh, the, um, the blood flow or the, the sudden change in map, if you look at different stress, dark of deflation, set to stand, have changes in cerebral blood flow here, changes in mean arterial pressure and changes in conductance here. Sudden change in MAP will, will be transmitted directly to the brain, but brain blood flow will tend to return to its baseline value. So roughly in response to that kind of transient hypotension, it will take around like five, six seconds to autoregulation to kick in. And those fast mechanisms that permit restoration of brain blood flow are referred to uh, dynamic autoregulation. So this is one mechanism for sure that will definitely help dampen those change in cerebral perf uh, perfusion pressure. And most likely, if the, the change in blood pressure is quick, it's quick sur surges, and it's important in the first few seconds of exercise, this, this uh, time period could be uh, dramatic for some, for some patients. But again, if the, the intervals are longer, autoregulation will definitely be of some help. Interestingly, there are, uh, in the last few years, there, the, the, some uh, uh, scientists uh, published that there is evidence of hysteresis in the cerebral pressure flow relationship. So the blood vessel will react differently when blood pressure increases compared to when blood pressure decreases. And here you have uh, colleagues from uh, UBC who uh, published a reanalysis of uh, several studies where they look at steady state changes in blood velocity or blood flow in response to changes in, in, in blood pressure. And you can clearly see the slope of increase is less important compared to the slope of, the, the slope of decrease, suggesting that the brain is, or the, the brain vessels uh, are better adapted to, to answer to blood pressure increases compared to blood pressure decreases. Um, this is steady state, so well, maybe it's in response to dynamic blood pressure, it's not the same that, that is happening. So we tested that using repeated squat stand maneuvers that we were already using for, uh, to force blood pressure for transfer function analysis. But we used uh, delta, or we analyzed delta changes in, in, in blood flow over blood, uh, uh, blood, sorry, blood velocity over blood, uh, blood pressure. And we observe and forget the, the absolute terms here in response to, uh, so when we um, look at the, we average those delta changes in blood pressure when blood pressure increase compared with when, we, when it decreases, we've seen also a less important increase in blood velocity, but the same change in blood pressure when blood pressure increase compared to when blood pressure decrease. Again, these results suggest that uh, the, 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 the cerebrovasculature is better adapted to react to when blood pressure acutely increases. For, for the students out there, when you publish something, this, it's not necessarily the absolute uh, the, um, right thing to, to, uh, to uh, or at least there will be most likely other uh, factors that will influence that. So Dr. Panery uh, also looked at that uh, the impact of the direction of blood pressure on how the, the vessel will react. And in that first uh, study, a little bit later after our publication, they directly contradict our results, but one year later, they also supported our results. So of course, there will be a lot more to, to look at with that issue. But interestingly, and I think in terms of uh, with the health perspective, knowing that the brain vasculature could be better to react to increased blood pressure, who increases in blood pressure, this is interesting, at least in terms of neuroprotection. A second mechanism will be, could be sympathetic activity. So a change in sympathetic activity. I had the opportunity to do my postdoc a few years ago now in Neil Sacker's lab where I did all sort of crazy thing. And I got really interested in sympathetic nervous activity. And I had the occasion to talk a lot and read a lot about sympathetic activity and the brain and sympathetic control of the, of the brain circulation. And 
that will definitely be a, a focus of the lab in the, in, in the last in the next few years. Of course, in humans, it's really um, difficult to uh, we, yeah, you, you you need to think carefully in terms of design to uh, specifically specifically focus on cerebral SNA. But in um, in animals, you have that Casiglia paper where the in an animal model, they look at increase acute increases in blood pressure looking at different ways of or different means to increase blood pressure sorry uh, and they measured sympathetic nervous activity in the cer superior cervical ganglion and when blood pressure increase whether it is uh, pharmacologically or with an intra uh, arctic balloon you see the uh, uh, here the ch person change in map and the person change in cerebral SNA, and you have an increase in activity in response to uh, an increase in blood pressure, but nothing or almost nothing happened when the, the the blood pressure reduces. So again, this is another mechanism that will that could be interesting uh, uh, and help for neuroprotection protection in response to uh, hit induced increase in blood pressure. In humans, again, not easy. You have the, Dr. Aisler who developed a method to estimate old body uh, and regional organ specific SNA. And they are, so it's called the norepinephrine spillover. And they applied that, uh, that method in, uh, in the brain in Niels, uh, in Niels Hacker's lab. And this is, this is an interest, a very interesting approach to study that, uh, that question. And I've, I've, after uh, 10 years of trying, five years of, sub, uh, of, uh, of submission to, to get that funding, we have finally uh, this year obtained a five year uh, of funding to study exactly that, that is the impact or the importance of cerebral SNA when blood pressure increases. And uh, we will, uh, we'll, so it's feasible even in Quebec, <laughs> even if we are not in Copenhagen. So we will address that issue, the importance of sympathetic activity, and maybe in the f in the in the next few years uh, we could have that same virtual uh, seminar, specifically on sympathetic nervous activity and its role and its importance uh, in uh, when blood pressure increases for humans. So other than cerebral regulation and SNA and maybe cerebral SNA, you also have the presence of uh, hyperventilation during. Uh, higher intensity of exercise, which will, which will be related to a reduction in, in cerebral blood velocity and cerebral blood flow. And that the presence of that hyperventilation could also be an important for, that, for neuroprotection during that type of exercise. And we know that it's associated with better flow regulation during map changes, but is it enough to counteract increases in, in cerebral blood flow induced by uh, by hit, so we definitely need to look a little bit more into uh, that issue. I didn't pay attention to the the, the to the the, the regional differences uh, because it's definitely not not the same when you compare anterior and posterior circulation. So to confuse the picture for even further, you have changes in cerebral blood flow with increasing intensity during incremental exercise exhaustion. And you have the person change in cerebral perfusion. And when you look carefully, you have that biphasic pattern when you look at um, ICA blood flow, MCA blood, uh, MCA blood velocity, and global cerebral blood flow. So up to 60% of maximal exercise, you have an increase in blood flow, and then you will have a decrease toward baseline. But if you look at uh, PCA blood velocity and vertebral artery blood flow, you will have an continuous increase. And this could be explained by, um, so that different blood distribution could be explained by uh, um, um, differences in cerebral regulation between the anterior and posterior circulation, cerebrovascular reactivity, and different uh, sympathetic uh, nervous activity between the re brain regions. And overall, those regional differences in flow regulation may make the uh, regions supplied by vertebral arteries more susceptible to hyperperfusion during quick surges and blood pressure. So unless countered by those neuroprotective influences of autoregulation, cerebral uh, sympathetic nervous activity, and the presence of hypocapnia, those surges in arterial blood pressure increase the risk of, of, of hyperperfusion injury, leading to stroke and potentially to stroke and blood-brain barrier breakthrough. So this is, I think, why it was important to to, to, to focus on, on acute high intensity exercise responses. There are not a lot out there and Laurence, Christine and Timo will focus on that in upcoming talks.
talks. I think it's important to, again, I, I put the beneficial adaptations aside, but to keep in mind that repetitive or transient um, increase in blood pressure could eventually be deleterious. It's an extreme model. It's difficult to put everything together when there is exercise, but um, Aaron Phillips and colleagues uh, um, reported uh, re, uh, findings where they, uh, they, 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 they described in a model, animal model with uh, spinal cord injury that just not a chronic hypertension, but transient acute increase in, in, in blood pressure over several days uh, led to cerebrovascular endothelial dysfunction. So this is, so here you have uh, in, in patients with spinal cord injury, just uh, playing with the bladder, you have increases in blood pressure and increases in blood flow, in blood velocity. So it's pretty linear. You have in animal with uh, spinal cord injury, you see the same, and even in, in healthy, uh, healthy, healthy animals, suggesting that maybe it's not the same in terms of uh, outcome, but the, the risk is there because of uh, pressure passive changes in, 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 in blood flow. I focus my talk on, on changes in blood pressure, but of course, in some of those patients, you will often see uh, arterial stiffness. So if pulse pressure is, in, is, is widened, and if pulse pressure is maintained right through uh, microcirculation, that could also become a, a, a problematic over time. Again, it's not necessarily just once, but over time. So we don't have any like ECG for the brain. So what, what could we do in, in during uh, or while we better know how exercise, how it affect the brain acutely? Well, of course, we could have a series, a battery of tests uh, looking at autoregulation, CO2 reactivity, neuro, neurovascular coupling. In some patients, it's feasible. So to better know how the cerebrovascular vasculature will react. And this is what we do, uh, Laurence will do, uh, is doing with patients with peripheral artery disease. So she's characterizing their cerebrovascular function. We're looking if it's, if, if it's safe to acutely performing high intensity exercise and when we'll be okay. We will focus on 12 or 16 weeks of it in these uh, patients compared to standard care. So I will skip that because... So of course, one the, the and I will complete with that, if we find in some patients that it's risky, one could say, should we stop their, their exercise? Stop uh, asking them to stop exercise. Of course, no, because we'll have a bunch of ways to optimize the, 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 the response and make sure to attend San Lucas uh, seminar because the UHE will focus on that with uh, their, their abstract talk. So I, if I conclude, so should we, we, should we hit our brain? So we know, already know that acute chronic and chronic exercise is beneficial for cerebrovascular health. In terms of healthy individual patients, a lot of those uh, individuals are already doing HIIT. So I think if it's well prescribed, it's feasible, but we definitely need to uh, examine it with more scrutiny, cerebrovascular EBO dynamics during and after, as Laurence will, uh, will show you, uh, after HIIT in patients with, uh, especially with attenuated neuroprotective mechanisms. And in the meantime, we need, definitely need to pay attention to how we prescribe it in some of these patients. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to uh, answer a few questions. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for that excellent talk this morning. Um, I've just posted in the, in the chat, um, if anyone has questions, uh, you can ask them, um, just let me know and I'll, I'll call on you to actually unmute yourself and ask the question, um, or you can post it in the chat there as well. So, anyone have any questions out there? Uh, so we've got a presentation, uh, sorry, a question here from uh, Zandra and Tan. Um, excellent presentation. Is there a dose response effect to the benefits of HIT? Hmm. Uh, it's a good question. I think that we are just in the beginning of that, of, the, of, of characterizing that issue. So a lot of characterization needs to be done. I think that what the Timo will present would be interesting. We need to keep in mind that at different intensity, so blood velocity, blood flow will increase. So if we focus on high intensity with the presence of hyperventilation, so maybe that will be associated with lower blood flow. So if we 
put the blood pressure issue aside, maybe we would need to focus on maybe moderate intensity intervals to have like the, the, the old beneficial impact of uh, oscillatory blood flow changes and blood pressure, but without the risk, associated risk with, of, of high blood pressure. Because we think of high blood pressure with when, when people are, are doing super maximal at 300 watts, but we had a, a patient with peripheral artery disease with, I think he was pedaling at one, 115 watts and it was associated with a huge increase above 200 uh, of millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure. So, yeah. Um, just as a, as a follow up to that, Pat, um, um, you talked about pulsatility uh, in terms of it potentially being harmful to the brain. Uh, but obviously with HIIT exercise, you are inducing a pulsatile flow, but it's at a very different time scale. Do you have any comments on perhaps differences between you know, pulsatility that's seen as, as harmful versus maybe pulsatility that's seen as um, um, protective in some way? Hmm. It's most likely a little bit as uh, the blood pressure variability. Uh, I have I, I don't have I don't have a lot of knowledge of, about specific impact of uh, arterial stiffness and, and pulsatility, but of course, if it's in the long term between visits, it will definitely have a like less beneficial impact of, uh, compared to just uh, acute differences in in pulse in pulse pressure. I think that the 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 main problem here is if that pulsatility is is maintained through the arterial uh, uh, tree. So usually you will have less pulsatility or almost no pulsatility in the microcirculation. And if it, this pulsatility is maintained, this is, I think, when it will be, become problematic, even in response to exercise or acute exercise. In, in yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got another question on the chat from Blake Perry. Um, he says, thanks to the talk. Uh, do you think that when characterizing HIT, the modality is also important? Rowing demonstrates a blood pressure profile like resistance exercise and repeated breath holds. Cycling, not so much. Yeah. Um, yeah with what could be true with the high intensity exercise could also be, uh, be true for resistance exercise. Uh, and those... Uh, people experiencing or doing resistance exercise will experience much more important surges in, in blood pressure. So um, again, acutely, uh, the problem I think is not there, but it, it's the repetitive. So not, notwithstanding, or even if it's bike versus or aerobic exercise versus resistance exercise, we, we, we definitely need to know much more about acute repetitive trends and increase in blood pressure on, on cerebral vascular function. Okay, um, just one more question for you, Pat. Um, this is from Mohammed al -Watban. Um He says, great talk. Um, since the relationship between ETCO2 and MCAV is almost linear, can we simplify, simply multiply by a factor to adjust for the effect of ETCO2 during HIIT exercises? Uh, you, yeah, yeah, we could definitely uh, adjust afterward, but it doesn't remove the fact that the influence will be or will of pet CO two will be or won't be there, depending if the CO two reactivity of the vessel is is adequate or not. So, of course, but during the exercise, which will be important, it's it's it, it's there that we first need to focus and characterize to ensure that um, those blood pressure changes, which could be very important in, in some patients, is not deleterious uh, in the long run. Or maybe it's, it will explain why for some patients that the, the beneficial adaptation won't be that important because it's attenuated by maybe less adapt beneficial adaptations because of changes in blood pressure. Okay, great, Pat. I think we'll, we'll move on to the first uh, abstract talk. So I'm going to hand off to you to, uh, to chair the next portion of the session this morning. Yes. So, I will uh, also the next talk will be uh, from uh, Alison Whitaker, who is uh, in the lab of Sandra Bellinger, a, uh, uh, um, a PhD student, and she will 
present very interesting results from a systematic uh, review about the uh, impact of, of uh, high intensity exercise on cerebrovascular function. Thank you. Okay, so like Dr. Brazard said, um, I'm Allison Whitaker. I'm a physical therapist by trade, um, and I'm in Dr. Sandra Billinger's lab at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, I recently just started the PhD program in rehabilitation science, um, and I was especially interested in looking at the effects of high-intensity interval exercise on cerebral vascular function. Um, so therefore, I decided to do a systematic review. So like most of you, um, probably, I was, in, I was um, inspired by the narrative reviews that came out in 2015 and here recently in 2020, um, looking at the molecular and the hemodynamic and structural processes that occurred during high intensity interval exercise. Um, and looking at the systemic blood pressure and these rapid and repetitive increases that occur with high intensity interval exercise. Uh, potentially causing cerebrovascular hyperperfusion, like Dr. Bazard was talking about, um, and the neuroprotective mechanisms that can occur. Um, and so I really wanted to dive deep into the literature for my dissertation project um, and look at what all has been done, um, the protocols, and the results of these studies. Um, so to my knowledge, we're the first to systematically search and report the results of studies looking at the effects of acute and chronic bouts of high-intensity interval exercise on cerebral vascular function. So our objective was to compare this to moderate continuous exercise or compare it to resting conditions. We wanted to specifically look um, in healthy individuals and we included all cerebral vascular outcomes um, and we operationalized them based on categories. However, the primary outcomes that I was really interested in was the middle cerebral artery blood velocity and the dynamic cerebral autoregulation. So for our methods, we included articles between January 2010 to June 2020. Um, we used the keywords that describe this high intensity interval training and exercise um, and different cerebrovascular measures such as blood flow, velocity, and autoregulation. Um, we set our inclusion criteria a priori. We wanted to specifically look for experimental or quasi-experimental studies. Um, we wanted the mode of high intensity interval exercise to be aerobic. Um, we included uh, cerebral vascular outcomes if they were primary or secondary, and we wanted to look at human subjects with no current disease states. So after doing an article search in PubMed and CINAHL, we found 67 articles. Um, and after removing duplicates, we found 20. Um, so Dr. Mohammed Awatband and I then looked through the abstracts and excluded 11 due to not having the high intensity interval exercise as the primary protocol, um, not specifically measuring cerebral arteries and um, an animal study. We then looked at the full text articles and excluded two due to not being an experimental or quasi-experimental design. So in all, we included seven articles within the systematic review. So here are the results of the study. Um, like I said, we operationalized them into categories based on the specific cerebrovascular measures. Um, I'm gonna talk through uh, the primary outcomes. So when they're highlighted in blue, that is the chronic effect of high intensity interval exercise interventions. And then if they're highlighted in red, um, that's the acute effect of a single bout of high intensity interval exercise. So looking at the resting MCAV, um, we had two studies that looked at six week or 12 week high intensity interval exercise interventions and found no significant changes after those interventions in the resting MCAV. We also had um, two studies look at a single bout of high intensity interval exercise and the exercise MCAV. And both studies reported a significant decrease in MCAV compared to moderate continuous exercise. However, they had conflicting results um, compared to rest, um, which I'll talk about in the discussion. So one uh, study then went on to 
look at the exercise MCAV immediately post and found that it was significantly decreased immediately after exercise, um, but was regained at 30 minutes, um, which Christine will talk about later. So then moving on to autoregulation, dynamic autoregulation, we had one study look at six weeks of high intensity interval exercise intervention um, and found a significant decrease in the phase after the intervention. And then we had an acute effect um, study looking at a single bowel and they found a decrease in the systolic phase um, over the diastolic and mean phase. So, um, for time, I'm not going to report on the rest of the outcomes. However, um, if you're interested in reading this, the link is at the bottom of our preprint that we've put out. So in discussion, um, looking at MCAV, the chronic effects, um, there was no significant change after um, an intervention of six to 12 weeks, um, and that could possibly be due to the exercise duration not being long enough. Um, it could also be due to a ceiling effect on resting MCAV because um, these were young, healthy, fit individuals. Um, and the studies also did not report on any cardiovascular measures that could potentially affect that resting MCAV. Um, then looking at the acute effects of a single bout, um, both studies reported a decrease compared to moderate intensity exercise. And this is potentially due to that hyperventilation induced vasoconstriction that decreases MCAV. However, they had conflicting results compared to resting baseline measures. Um, and this could be due to one study looked at an average of the entire bout of high intensity interval exercise, whereas another study looked at each average uh, interval. And they found that towards the later stages of this high intensity interval exercise is when you see a significant decrease compared to baseline. Um, it could also be due to differences in the sample. So one looked at adults and one looked at children. Then looking at autoregulation, uh, the chronic effects after six weeks um, showed, no, uh, showed a significant decrease. And this could be due to um, elevated cardiorespiratory fitness and endurance trained athletes actually being associated with um, decreased uh, autoregulation, dynamic autoregulation. Um, the acute effects showed a significant decrease in the systolic phase, which may, which may be more telling than the diastolic or mean phase. Um, and this lasts up to four hours, with which the authors concluded that um, our common practice of having an individual abstain from exercise 12 hours before our research studies may be too conservative. So in conclusion, future research is definitely warranted. We had a limited number of studies um, that were small randomized trials of young fit individuals. Um, so we definitely recommend for cerebral vascular measures, not only doing it during high intensity exerval, interval exercise, but immediately following and um, continuing post high intensity interval exercise should include large randomized control trials um, and we also need to look at optimal parameters um, as the intensities and the timing of intervals and the duration of high intensity interval exercise um, was vastly different in all of these studies. So it was hard to compare. Um, this uh, review looking at healthy individuals may be able to look uh, and compare to clinical populations. And further down the line, I definitely think there's room to look at intervention, exercise interventions um, that optimize brain health. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Alison. So this uh, abstract is open for questions. I may have one if you are still shy. Oh, okay. For uh, for Jamie from uh, Jamie McDonnell for Professor Brassan and Miss Whitaker, as HIP aims to chronically decrease systemic systemic blood pressure, are there any populations whereby HIT and exercise generally generally should be avoided? For example, in elderly patient with hypertension, if hypertension is corrected. 
Yeah, so I think um, in the cerebral vascular literature, that's pretty limited. Um, they have done high intensity interval exercise in hypertensive subjects um, and shown a decrease in systolic blood pressure over time, um, but they're not sure uh, within the cerebral vasculature. At least to my knowledge, I don't think that's been studied. Yeah. Uh, I may have a, a question. Uh, are you surprised considering like all the beneficial adaptations that we see from short to long-term exercise training in other function? When you look at at least maybe not cognitive function, but cerebrovascular function, determinants of cerebral blood flow uh, regulation, is it is it surprising to see maybe like that that amount of equivocal results, uh, even if in athletes? Can you repeat the question? Uh, so, just because we, yeah. when, when you look at, like, exam, for example, blood pressure, you will look at blood glucose. It's, it's uh, so short, short term or long term chronic exercise will, will, will lead to beneficial adaptation. For, but, but for the brain, it seems equivocal. Is it, is it surprising or why? Yeah, um, definitely. I, it is surprising to look at these results. Um, kind of looking at the chronic versus acute effects is definitely surprising as well. Um, and um, how, how the cerebrovascular system responds um, acutely um, due to that hyperventilation response and um, autoregulation then uh, being significantly decreased. I think um, after reading your narrative reviews, it made sense, but <laughs> um, at, at first when looking at the results, yeah, it was very surprising. Thanks. If there is no other question, I think uh, I will again thank you, uh, Alison, and yeah. we'll move to the next talk. So the next talk will be uh, from uh, Laurence Labrec, who is a PhD student or candidate in my lab, uh, looking at all different things, and she will present some uh, interesting results, I think, uh, about uh, acute changes in, in cerebral blood velocity um, in young fit women. So, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Lawrence. I'm a PhD candidate and I'm working with Patrice. And um, the results I'm showing you today um, are results from my master. And they are um, uh, results that were published recently uh, in last May um, in a paper in phys Physiological Reports. So has Patrice and Elise well presented um, high intensity interval training? Um, in fact, is this type of training is characterized by the repetition of intense exercise intervals. And um, before even looking at uh, the impact of um, a training over multiple weeks um, or looking into only one session, we don't even know what is happening during one interval. So there is very few literature. And as we know, the rise in arterial pressure during uh, one um, interval can be very important because the exercise intensity are high or might be even super maximal. So characterizing the response during is important. And as I told, it's, it, it has not been studied a lot. Um, to the best hour of our knowledge, before we published um, our study in May, there was only one study who we looked into um, cerebral blood flow uh, during one um, exercise bout that was done at high intensity. So in this study, in this case, what they observed is a 16% 16, 16 increase in uh, middle cerebral artery blood velocity that was coupled to an increase of 16 millimeters of mercury uh, in blood pressure. Um, however, in this study, it was only done in male subjects, and blood velocity was only measured um, in the middle cerebral artery. Uh, and since um, sex could have an impact on, um, as we know, uh, either it's um, CO2 reactivity or cerebral artery regulation, uh, we need to know also this response in women and as we know, um, there might also have um, regional differences in um, uh, the distribution of cerebral blood flow and its regulation, either it's at rest or uh, during exercise. So 
Um, since cerebral velocity during HIIT have only been described in anterior circulation and only in men, um, we consider it would be important to describe this in women and to be both looking uh, in to be looking in both uh, anterior and posterior circulation. So that's why the aim of our study was to describe the regional cerebral blood velocity uh, during and following an acute bout of high intensity exercise in young healthy women. So we were only looking during one bout, not even a session. Um, so what we did uh, is that we recruited 10 healthy active women that were all tested during uh, day zero to 10 of their menstrual cycle. There were two visits to this study. So during the first visit, of course, we took the anthropometrics and we measured the maximal HO2 consumption. And we as well um, measured the maximal aerobic power to um, determine the workload of the high intensity um, exercise interval that we would do uh, on the second visit. And yeah, as written there, we did an intense exercise interval of 30 seconds during the second visit. So continuously during both of these visits, we had continuous measure of um, blood velocity in the cerebral artery. So we are using a transcranial Doppler. We had the MCA on the left and the PCA on the right. Uh, we also had a continuous measurement of mean arterial pressure using photoplatosmography. Uh, more specifically, we are using the next one. And then of course we had a gas analyzer. Um, we were specifically interested in uh, partial pressure of entire CO2 or PET CO2. So for the intense exercise interval, the modalities we used, um, so we first asked our participants to warm up for three minutes at 50 watts, just to not make them do an, one intense bout of exercise without even being warmed up. And then we asked the women to just remain seated on the bike, uh, calmly not speaking for three minutes uh, of rest. And then um, they speed up for 30 seconds at maximal aerobic power. And then we asked them again to completely stop pedaling and then remain uh, still at rest on, for three minutes on the, on the bike. So we had like rest, uh, warm up, rest 30 seconds, and then rest again um, to evaluate the, the response during the recovery as well. So for the result, what we had, so these are the characteristics of our 10 women. Um, as you see, VO2 max is pretty elevated for these women. They were uh, trained in various um, endurance sports. At the maximum aerobic power, this was uh, the average of the, the workload they had uh, for the 30 second, the whole 30 second um, exercise bout. So regarding, um, Resting values, um, so resting values are very normal. And as you see, MCA is greater than PCA. This is something we expect. And uh, partial pressure of entitled CO2, but CO2 was normal at rest as well. So this is an average response of our 10 subject. So you have at the top panel, uh, the, the cerebral blood velocity in the MCA, you have the PCAV and then the MAP and the PET CO2. So as expected, there was a continuous increase of mean arterial pressure throughout the whole uh, exercise bout. And um, we, uh, there was also an acute increase as was observed by the, with, in the study I presented earlier, there was an acute increase in both MCAV and PCAV and then a return toward baseline. So this is um, the B basic pattern that we uh, are describing there. And there's also an interesting um, increase during recovery of both MAP and um, blood velocities. And I'll look more into detail the PET CO2 um, in the upcoming slides. So what we did to analyze uh, this print is that we, um, used the baseline values, which were um, a few seconds before the onset of the exercise. And then we identified the peak for both MCA and PCA reached during the 30 seconds. And we look for the, the mean arterial pressure at this specific peak. So if, for example, uh, the MCA peak was happening at nine seconds, we were looking for the, the map at that time. So this, for each subject, it's aligned in time. Um, and then at the end, we averaged the last five seconds of the sprint 
And during the recovery, again, we took the peak MCA, the peak PCA, and we, we looked for the map at, that, at those specific values. Um, so there were a, an effect of time, of course, so as we, we saw on the, the, the previous graph, but there was no effect of uh, artery. So there was no regional differences in the response to a, a 30 second uh, intense exercise bout. So if we look more specifically uh, into PET-CO2, there is a, a very um, interesting um, pattern there. So initially during the 30 second bout, so the dark line is the, the onset and the dotted line is the end of the 30 second bout. There was a drop of three millimeters of mercury happening around nine seconds following the onset of exercise. And then there was a return um, to baseline value at the end of the exercise. What is, there, is interesting is what's happening in the recovery period. So what we observed is a peak value of PET-CO2. Um, actually, the PET-CO2 increased from baseline to L even millimeters of mercury, 23 seconds into recovery. And after the three minutes of recovery, uh, PET-CO2 was still 9% higher um, over the last seconds of recovery. So um, as we see, the recovery is characterized with great increases in PET-CO2 um, and is therefore, um, therefore causes great increases in both MCA velocity and PCA velocities. So this, has, uh, this is an important uh, um, thing to consider uh, regarding perspectives of where we're, where we're going with this, these results. So as a conclusion, what we are able to say is that there is a biphasic response of cerebral, um, and here I wrote flow, but it's velocity <laughs> to a 30 second um, high intensity interval, and that the recovery is characterized by important elevation in cerebral blood flow, or at least cerebral blood velocity. Um, of course, there are limitations to the study. So we only studied uh, young, healthy women. Um, so we cannot uh, extend these results to other type of population, or even to men, or older ones. Or, and also they were fit. So even maybe we could not uh, extend these results to people who are sedentary. Um, of course, there are limitations uh, using transcranial Doppler uh, since with change in that CO2, the diameter of the arteries could change as well. And the menstrual cycle control was not perfect. So we had some women on contraceptive pills, although we used um, the sugar pills, the, the sugar pill um, moment for them as well. Um, but yeah, there are interesting perspectives regarding this, um, this response to high intensity interval. So of course, it's not, a, it's not a hit session. So what happens if we um, addition all this hit? So that's what Simo was going to talking about, be talking about, or Christine will be talking about. And then um, what if we add a warm up? So we used a, a three minute period between the warm up and the hit. But if we warm up and then we just start with the hit, there is also an interesting uh, insight to, to look into. Um, there are also various durations of interval. So there we use 30 seconds, but we could use 15 seconds, one minute, four minutes. So there is very a lot of modalities for high intensity interval training. And then as well, um, the increase in recovery. So what happened during, depending of the length of the recovery or depending if it's an active or a passive recovery, what happens if we add uh, another um, interval and as well, what happens if it's clinical population with um, impaired CO2 reactivity? Or, so there is a lot of questioning, but it gives us a basis um, to see what happens during high intensity interval training. Yeah, mostly this is it. Thank you, if you have questions. Thank you very much, Lars. So we have one from Max Weston. Hi, Lawrence. Max Weston from University of Exeter. Great talk. Thank you. You say that the increase in MCA velocity and PCA velocity following exercise is caused by elevated PET CO2 during recovery. Did you perform any analysis to show that the magnitude of these were related? So, so for example, do those with a greater PET CO2 increase during recovery show greater elevation in blood velocity? 
um, sorry, go with that again. So essentially, was it, did, did you perform analysis to link the two? So did you make any correlation associations or to see if the blood, cha uh, blood velocity changes during recovery was associated with that CO2 changes? In uh, we, did, we did not do correlation, but clearly it's, it's, it's like a very delayed, a perfect delayed response. So clearly it is, um, and the, the pattern during recovery, the, the mean arterial pressure pattern during recovery does not fit with the cerebral velocity one. And since we know PET CO2 is a great uh, modulator for cerebral velocity, so, but no, we did not uh, perform correlation analysis. From a question from Mohamed Al Watvan, great talk. The standard deviation for the PC velocity across all subjects during rest is less than MCV mean, but during the exercise, the peak PC velocity has higher standard deviation than MC velocity. Is there any explanation? Well, it's been a little while. I've not been looking in the individual um, values. So at rest, of course, it's normal since the the values of PCA are are lower. Um, there is a pretty heterogeneous pattern. Like some will increase a lot. So everyone increased their uh, sort of blood velocity, but it seems like there is pretty heterogeneous pattern. Um, but e. yeah, and it's still again, it's in uh, it's a relative value. So I'd say that. Um, it's hard to compare. We cannot really compare uh, blood velocities without taking the, the relative values. So if, um, for example, a PCA increase of eight centimeters, um, centimeter per second, in relative, it's always greater than for the MCA. Um, so I would say the heterogeneity of the, the response is, it's a mix of using relative values, comparing so although we use relative value, PCA is still lower. And uh, yeah, heterogeneity of the response. OK. Um, thanks. <laughs> so if uh, there is no other question, oh, yes. Ron Schondorf, do you have any data evaluating blood velocity response to inhale CO2 to achieve your pCO2 values post hit? No. <laughs> now that would be an interesting Short, yeah. Yeah, yeah. would be really interesting but no right uh, oh Sam Lucas Rista, do you think days 1 to 10 reflect the whole menstrual cycle absolutely not um, yeah we have studying women is fun but it's hard because of using menstrual cycle so no this is the low hormone phase that we Oh, if we wanted to be even more perfect, we would have taken days from one to 10 or one to five or one to three. Um, of course, in the study, we had some more visits that I'm not presenting here. Um, at the beginning of the study, we were training women. So we had to take them at the right moment. They had to be available. So we enlarged this, um, this inclusion criteria to be able to have uh, some women in the study. But um, no, it does not reflect the whole menstrual cycle. And there are um, variability um, of CO2 reactivity throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, and there is also an effect of the, 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 the contraceptive pill. So um, there is also a lot of, a lot of thing to, to discover uh, in this impact as well. So just to follow up on Sam's question, do, would you see similar results at the end of the, if you have studied the, the, the women at the end of the menstrual cycle, cons considering the latest uh, publication on CO2 reactivity and the sex differences in CO2 reactivity and other regulation? Maybe, maybe we, we could experience it. <laughs> but yeah, maybe would be interesting. Right. Thank you, Lars. So we'll move on to the Third presentation from Kristen Tallon, PhD candidate in Alan McManus lab at the UBC, and she will present about intracranial vascular responses to high intensity interval exercise and moderate intensity steady state exercise in children.
Perfect. Can you see that now, Pat? Yes. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm a PhD candidate within Dr. Ali McManus's pediatric exercise lab. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she and her. Um, as Allison hinted at briefly within her presentation earlier on, uh, this data that I'm presenting has been published back uh, last year, looking at the comparison in intracranial responses between high and moderate intensity exercise in children. Uh, so first off, just to set the stage a little bit between the adult literature, um, this figure on the left of your screen illustrates the dynamic metabolic need of the human brain. If we look across the x-axis of this figure, we see nearly twofold demand by the brain at the age of eight, with approximately 40% of the resting metabolic rate within the brain in comparison to that of the adult values quoted to be around about 20%. Not surprisingly, this metabolic need of the brain is matched by an increased cerebral perfusion at the prepubertal age. So we see just as that metabolic need of the brain is dynamic, cerebral perfusion fluctuates as the child ages and matures. Up until recently, an overwhelming majority of the literature has focused on the adult cerebrovascular responses to exercise. This figure from Dr. Smith and colleagues in 2017 is one I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It depicts an increase in cerebral perfusion above baseline during moderate, mild and moderate exercise and a subsequent fall in cerebral perfusion at maximum exercise connected to hyperventilation induced hypocapnia. Our lab subsequently compared the adult cerebrovascular response during maximal exercise to that of the child we found consistent with the previous review um, that the increase in mean MC velocity matched, was matched with an increase in end tidal CO2 up until that ventilatory threshold, at which point you can see a downward drift of the mean MCA velocity simultaneously with a hypocapnia as a result, as the adults reach maximum. However, what we found when we look at the pediatric response was an attenuated mean MC velocity response, increasing to about half that at the peak of the peak adult response. And further to this, we saw this disconnect of the mean MC velocity from the entitled CO2 during exercise with a continuous decrease in entitled CO2 from rest all the way throughout until maximum. So this project really just got us started looking at exercise bouts in children. So the object objective of this study um, was to explore how an acute bout of high intensity and moderate intensity exercise impacts intracranial blood velocity in the child. We thought twofold that first off, the increase in mean MC velocity would be greater during moderate intensity compared to that during high intensity. And that the mean MC velocity would be lower than baseline immediately following high intensity exercise, and then increase in an upregulated manner above baseline values 30 minutes post-exercise. Subsequent, that the mean MCA velocity would return to baseline values following the moderate intensity condition. So to complete this investigation, we had children visit the laboratory on three separate occasions. The first visit included anthropometric measurements and a stature dependent a maximal exercise test with a super maximal verification. So this looks like we had a three minute warm up unloaded for the children, subsequently followed by their stature dependent maximal exercise test. And in order to perform the super maximal verification to ensure that the kids truly did reach a max point, immediately following their volitional cessation of the exercise test, they engaged in active recovery for five minutes unloaded, they sat quietly on the bike for 10 minutes. Subsequently, we warmed them back up for two minutes and then they cycled at 105% of their total watt max to ensure VO2 max was reached. The randomized crossover design of this trial contained two conditions. Um, during the second and third visits, these conditions were completed, wherein four main outcome measures were assessed. We collected MSA velocity via transcranial Doppler. Heart rate was measured via 
uh, polar telemetry. Blood pressure is assessed using sphygmomanometry and end tidal CO2 recorded using an online gas analyzer ADI system. As I'll highlight further, data collected during exercise was in a seated position, while data collected at baseline and post-exercise was in a semi-supine position on a bed. Within each condition, baseline data is inclusive of heart rate, blood pressure, end tidal CO2, and MCA velocity, followed by a three-minute unlo unloaded warm-up. With respect to condition A, the high-intensity condition, had the children complete six one-minute sprints at 90% of watt max, with a one-minute recovery, active recovery following each sprint at 20% of watt max. During exercise only for both conditions, MCAV and heart rate were collected as a result of the children refusing to wear the mouthpiece during the sprints. With respect to condition B, the moderate intensity condition, we had the children work at 44% of watt max for a total of 15 minutes. The uh, discrepancy in the length of these exercise conditions was due to matching the two conditions for total external work using a, the calculating the square wave method. After completion of each exercise condition, the children were assessed immediately post-exercise and 30 minutes post-exercise for all measures included within the baseline assessment. For the study, we recruited 15 children in total. However, two children did not complete all six sprints of the high intensity condition. One child did not complete the entirety of the 15 minute moderate intensity condition. And the MC velocity data was incomplete in four children. So this left us with an N of eight children within the analysis ranging between the age of nine to 11 years of age, and a majority of whom were pre -pubertal. So The following two slides within the results will depict the response of the percent heart rate max and the relative mean MCA velocity. So first off, looking at the heart rate analysis as a percent of heart rate max, within the blue squares highlighted here, we see a trend of increasing heart rate throughout the moderate intensity protocol, though not statistically variant across time. And highlighted here within the red bars are the sprint interval, intervals, excuse me, with the white bars between the active recovery periods being represented. We see a significant increase in the cardiovascular load during the sprint intervals in comparison to the moderate intensity stages. This increase in percent of heart rate max does decrease to similar values during the recovery stages to those seen during the moderate intensity condition. Moving to the MCA velocity data, again, I've just highlighted in red, indicating the six active sprint uh, stages. We saw a difference during stage five and seven, just between the two conditions. However, of primary interest are the differences found at the beginning and the end of the protocol. So during this second stage highlighted here, we found an increase in mean MCA velocity significantly above baseline values within the moderate intensity condition. However, this was not sustained within the children and for the remainder of the uh, moderate intensity condition, there was no significant difference from baseline within their MCA velocity response. At the end of the protocol, the high intensity condition, uh, we saw a large, um, excuse me, we saw a significant decrease from baseline within the mean velocity of the within the high intensity condition um, throughout beginning up until that final sixth sprint, we saw large variation, but no significant difference from baseline throughout the entirety of that condition. With respect to the response following exercise, so immediately post exercise, we saw a significant decrease in the MCA mean velocity following both moderate and high conditions, followed by recovery to baseline values by 30 minutes um, post exercise. We saw a disconnect with the end tidal CO2 immediately following exercise, whereas there was only a significant drop following the high condition, but no significant change following the moderate condition, despite seeing that decrease in the relative MCA velocity. Now we also took a look at the heart rate and mean arterial pressure following exercise in comparison to baseline values. Resting heart rate was an average of about 77 beats per minute 
uh, at rest in both conditions. And we found that heart rate was significantly elevated above baseline immediately in both con conditions and remaining so only 30 minutes post the fall, the high condition, but returned to baseline levels following 30 minutes subsequently after the moderate intensity condition. Of the eight children included in the analysis, not all were able to attain satisfactory blood pressure measures within the time constraints of the protocol. Um, as such, the end decreased, as you can see for yourself, but within all measures, the uh, mean arterial pressure within the children were elevated above baseline levels uh, following each condition. And with that, I think it's clear that this study uh, raised more questions for us than answers. It was the first to report an impact of an acute bout of high intensity and moderate intensity exercise on intracranial blood velocity in children. And despite our primary hypothesis being uh, not supported by our data and having us show this increase in um, mean MCA velocity at the onset of moderate intensity, it was no greater than that of the high intensity condition. And further to that, we weren't able to support our second hypothesis and found that upon cessation of both conditions, MCA was reduced below baseline, below baseline and normalized by 30 minutes post-exercise. So with these findings um, in comparison to the literature, there has been research uh, by Sandra Billinger back in 2017 that with young adults, um, there's been a sustained increase in cerebral perfusion during submaximal exercise. However, this was during a six minute bout, um, so shorter duration than what we presented here, which raises the question, could our results be due to different differing exercise mode or intensity, or are they merely a result of age differences related and illustrated during their maximal exercise data presented previously? Um, for the, that, if the stimulus was altered, would we be able to um, maintain our MCA blood velocity response throughout the duration of a moderate intensity and overcome that fluctuation? And also I think of important to note would be asking whether or not this, we should include additional measures to monitor intensity. Um, so we saw that increased cardiovascular load during the sprints, but perhaps it wasn't intense enough for the children. Um, and finally, obviously the uh, data following each condition is of interest and whether or not the primary regulatory mechanism of intracranial blood velocity post-exercise could vary with an exercise intensity and mode in children is definitely a question to follow up with. Uh, briefly, obviously there are limitations with this data set. It is the first to, to investigate the, the question, but it does have its own limitations. Um, however, it is also the first to assess the intracranial velocity in children following the acute bout of exercise. So there are some benefits to it. And with that, I just like to thank both and acknowledge the funding agencies and my supervisor and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Christine. So is the I will just have a look at my chat. So great talk. If sex was included, so uh, sorry, question from Mohammed. What one? Great talk. If sex was included as a variable, do you think you would you would uh, you will find sex differences? I. It's a great question. Um, it's definitely a challenge, obviously within adult literature as well, but also within children, um, with puberty. So I would guess that if we had the power to look into sex that you wouldn't see a difference necessarily uh, pre-pubertal stages, but as children mature you could see possible sex differences in those older adolescents. Um, but in order to investigate that we need a, a strong measure in order to assess that maturation to be sure that what we're seeing is a result of those sex differences. Any other question? I would have one. Uh, what? How do you would you explain that 
quick reduction or that reduction in MCV velocity at the end of the, the intervals. While we are in Kirtland's, in, in Kirtland's study, we see that rapid increase in, in blood velocity after exercise. That's a great question. Um, I think that like, I've, I've talked with Ali at length about this and one possibility could be just the um, systemic nature of the body. The brain in the child is already highly perfused. Um, and if we've just put that pediatric body through high intensity or moderate intensity exercise, maybe it's just a matter of redistribution. Um, and that blood flow is now going to the leg because the children are already naturally at a higher level um, for perfusion within the brain. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Max Weston. Hey, Christine, fantastic talk. Thank you. The lack of steady state heart rate during moderate, could, uh, moderate exercise could represent that the intensity was slightly above that of a true moderate. Do you think possible hyperventilation could be driven MC velocity down in a moderate intensity in kids or not because MC velocity and PET CO2 are unrelated? Thanks, Max. Um, possible empathy. I I definitely agree with your first point, Max, around um, the idea of a, a true moderate, that perhaps we are because there is that drift. I'd also argue that there is no statistical difference, so there is no drift. Um, it's just a matter of that, that uh, the way it's displayed. Um, oh, I lost the question there. I do, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it could be hyperventilation driving down MCU during the miss um, because we didn't, we, we didn't measure it with the kids. I think it's definitely worth following up. We tried to use a, a mouthpiece within the children, um, but they refused within the sprints. Um, they found it too, too cumbersome and too intense and limited with their breathing. Um, so perhaps face mask with the children would be a better option in order to truly investigate that question. Great, we have a, another few questions, but we'll move on. So maybe Kristen, we will be able to answer in the, in the, chat, uh, in the chat room uh, in the meantime. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Excellent presentation. So the last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Timo Klein, a research fellow at the German Sport University, Cologne. So his talk will be about cerebral blood flow uh, during interval and continuous exercise in young and old men. Timo? All right, can you hear me well? Yep, perfect, and we see everything, thanks. So thank you, Pat and uh, Caroline, for setting up this seminar and including me in this. Uh, before I start, I would like to quickly introduce myself. So I did my PhD in Chris Askew's lab at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia, where I focused uh, on the influence of age on the cerebrovascular responses to exercise. So the data I'm going to present today was part of my PhD studies and published in MSSE in 2019. As it is commonly known, aging is associated with a reduction in cerebral blood flow and cerebrovascular function. And habitual exercise, on the other hand, has been shown to be protective against these negative effects of aging. Based on our understanding that increases in shear stress and blood flow are important for vascular adaptation, it is likely that increases in middle cerebral artery flow velocity lead to increases in cerebrovascular adaptation. The MCAV responses to exercise are tightly linked to intensity and the format used um, of exercise. Therefore, we are looking for ways to safely increase MCAV during acute exercise 
And this is in particularly important uh, in older adults where MCAV during exercise is reduced, as you can see here on the left-hand side. As we have already heard today, high-intensity interval exercise is gaining popularity in cardiovascular health, especially in older adults. However, high intensities do not lead to further increases in MCAV. The greatest MCAV responses are observed at moderate intensity, and therefore it would be counterintuitive to use high-intensity exercise to induce the greatest gains in cerebral blood flow and shear stress. At the onset of a single bout of um, continuous exercise, we see this initial increase in MCAV. With the progression of continuous exercise, however, MCAV gradually decreases. Interestingly, during a short bout of exercise followed by a short bout of recovery, MCAV increases even further during the recovery period than during the exercise period itself. And this is in line with what uh, Laurence has uh, showed before. With interval exercise, we are therefore interested in the accumulated MCAV response during a combination of acute exercise and recovery. By sustaining elevations in MCAV during short recovery periods, we hypothesized that interval exercise would lead to a greater overall accumulated MCAV response compared to continuous exercise. And therefore, the aim of this study was to compare the MCAV response between intensity and work-matched bouts of continuous and interval cycling exercise in younger and older men. We tested 11 younger men with an average age of 25 years and 10 older men with an average age of uh, 69 years. Both groups performed a bout of continuous exercise, which started with a five minute seated rest on the bike, followed by a 10 minute exercise and 10 minute recovery period on the bike. After a 30 minute break, an interval bout was performed, uh, which started again with five minute rest, followed by one minute of exercise and one minute of recovery. And this was uh, repeated for 10 consecutive times. Both exercise bouts were performed in a randomized order and at a power output of 60% of the participants watt max. Our experimental setup shows the participants in an upright sitting position on the bike with the left hand rested at the level of the heart. We continuously recorded MCAV via transcranial Doppler ultrasound and tidal CO2 with uh, AD instrument gas analyzer, heart rate with a three electrode ECG and finger blood pressure from the left middle finger. As expected, the results of resting measures showed that MCAV was lower in the older adults than in the young. Entitled CO2 was slightly lower and mean arterial pressure slightly higher in the older compared to the young. Here you can see the percent change in MCAV of a continuous bout of the young in blue. Each point presents an average over one minute and the percent MCAV showed an initial increase during exercise, which was maintained and reduced after the termination of exercise. The interval response for the young also showed an initial increase in percent MCAV and remained elevated throughout the whole bout of 20 minutes. The percent MCAV response for the continuous and interval bouts uh, for the old are shown in red. So when we consider the acute MCAV response, you can see that it was higher during continuous in the young compared with interval exercise, although there was no difference between continuous and interval exercise in the older adults. Our main aim was the accumulated MCAV response. Um, and to assess this, we calculated the area under the curve for the exercise and recovery periods, as you can see here on the right-hand side, as an example for the continuous bout of the young. We separately ca calculated the area under the curve for the 10-minute exercise bout and the 10-minute recovery bout and the total response of the to 
of the 20-minute uh, bout. So the accumulated MCAV responses are shown here for the young in blue and the old in red, which we compared between continuous and interval exercise periods, shown as the full bars, and between the continuous and interval recovery periods, uh, the dashed bars, and the total response. So these are the surrounded borders. The highest response during exercise was in the young during continuous exercise. Interestingly, the interval format when comparing the total response um, led to a higher accumulated MCAV than during continuous exercise, it's, so then during the continuous format. And this was observed for both younger and older adults. So we could show that moderate intensity interval exercise may offer potential benefits for older adults. Although interval exercise did not lead to larger increases in MCAV, it was at least as effective as continuous exercise in older men. And therefore, interval exercise at moderate intensity might offer a useful and safe strategy to induce increases in cerebral blood flow and shear stress without excessive rises in blood pressure. In the young, the rise in MCAV during the one minute exercise interval was significantly lower than, the observ than observed during the continuous exercise. At moderate intensity, MCAV did not reach its peak until the third or fourth minute uh, of continuous exercise, and this is consistent with others. So it is likely that um, the longer interval durations of four minutes would possibly lead to a greater MCAV response in the young adults. Vascular adaptation with exercise training are largely attributed to repetitive increases in blood flow and shear stress, which is observed during acute exercise. Whether this total accumulated MCAV response is important for future cerebrovascular adaptation is currently not known. However, it would at least suggest that acute dose of uh, the cerebral blood flow and shear stress response with interval exercise is greater than that achieved with continuous exercise. So in conclusion, um, the acute exercise in MCAV during intensity and work matched interval and continuous exercise was not different in older men whereas MCAV was higher during continuous exercise in younger men. This suggests that interval exercise may be an effective alternative for promoting acute increases in MCAV without excessive rises in blood pressure, particularly in those older adults who may not be able to sustain continuous exercise. In both older and younger participants, the accumulated MCAV was greater with interval exercise compared with continuous exercise. And whether this reflects a greater dose of shear stress with interval exercise remains to be determined. And there is now the need to investigate uh, the cerebrovascular adaptation to interval exercise training. So I would like to thank my collaborators, um, the University of the Sunshine Coast and the German Sports University, the VASO Active team, but especially my supervisor, Professor Chris Eskew, who introduced me to the field of cerebrovascular research and who has spent endless hours with me developing all the protocols and assessing papers. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Timo. So this uh, abstract is uh, open for questions. While uh, people are typing their uh, their questions, um, do you or maybe just like general question, do you think that you would have seen similar results in 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 women? And maybe uh, in the if you have looked or focus on the uh, posterior side of the brain. So these are definitely two very interesting questions. Um, so in regards to the first part with, uh, with the women, um, I think that's a great setup. Um, you and Laurence have um, to actually test this. So we will know more about this in the future. Um, Sandra Billinger has, um, has published some data on um, the kinetics in 
in females. So um, knowing these results, we could potentially um, see different, um, different responses in females and therefore this warrants uh, further investigation. Great. Uh, with, with the second part, uh, so in the posterior um, response, um, you have shown in your slides that the posterior um, cerebrovascular system acts different. Um, so therefore, we might have seen similar responses with this moderate intensity, but we could potentially see further increases uh, with uh, high intensity intervals. So I don't know that. So this, uh, again, warrants further investigation, but there is the potential. Great, thanks. Question from uh, Kurt Smith. Great talk, Timo. Any chance you have, uh, you have since collected any volumetric extracranial data? Previous data suggests that following continuous exercise flow may remain elevated while MC velocity does not. Curious if you have any insight into uh, flow following uh, interval activity. So this is a big limitation of our study that we only used um, TCD and uh, we don't have any volumetric uh, measures. Um, but um, as you said, um, Kurt, that um, yeah, the volumic measures even further increase after um, exercise. This uh, emphasizes that possibly this idea of uh, the accumulated uh, flow response um, is even more important uh, during the recovery periods. So um, we have to test this, um, and I'm sure you know best um, how to do that. Any other questions? I may have one last. If you are, it, it's really interesting in terms of getting rid of that risk uh, because of high blood pressure. But if, if, if you are in front of a older men or women with exercise induced hypertension, what do you do? Do you stick to 60% of uh, maximal workload or you go lower? Will, will it still be really, Will it still be still be related to beneficial adaptations at lower, at the lower dose? So um, I have not shown this data, but we already, uh, or prior to our our investigation, we um, we did a submaximal exercise test with all the participants, and um, we measured um, MCAV, uh, mean arterial pressure, and tidal CO2. So all the similar measures, um, and the elderly already showed um, responses at um, lower intensities. So possibly at 30% of uh, watt max, and this plateaued. So what Ellison said before that there might be a ceiling effect, uh, we potentially saw that in the older adults. Um, so um, if this, um, if there is also the positive effect at lower intensities with interval, um, we, have to, we have to check this. But I, I would definitely suggest um, a person with hypertension not to uh, put this person at risk as, you're, as you brought up this example with the, um, with the students to, to put them under, under a higher risk of um, elevated blood pressures. So I would stick to the lower, um, to the lower uh, intensities. And from our data, we have um, Possibly we see similar effects. Great. Ah, other questions since we are at the end and we, you seem warmed up now. Uh, let's, let's go ahead if you, if, you, if you don't mind. So Mohamed uh, Al-Watban, great talk. Is averaging every minute then integrating the area under the curve similar to summing all MC velocity values during exercise or recovery? Um, great that you spotted that. So um, I should have said that during the talk. So. Um, uh, the mean responses I showed, um, they were average of, averages over a minute, but we had beat to beat data and actually the area under the curve, um, we, um, we calculated from second by second data. So this was way more detailed than the, um, than the minute by minute responses. Great. And uh, maybe last one by Sam Lucas. Great talk, Timo. Given the literature showing the benefits of HIT for other systems and tissues, how do you think we should balance this against maximizing shear stress-mediated vascular adaptation in the brain? Tough one. <laughs> um, so we have tried to justify our study with um, the acute response in MCAV and that this is reduced um, during um, high intensities. 
and our aim was actually to look at the best uh, shear stress uh, response. So what Kurt mentioned before, we didn't have any volumic measures. Um, if we possibly have um, measured um, ICA with the similar setup, that would have possibly, uh, or that would have been possible to, to look at shear rate. Um, so given that MCAV is lower uh, than at high intensity than moderate exercise, I would assume that the shear stress response during exercise, acutely during exercise, um, might be highest. Although this might be a different story uh, if we look at um, the recovery periods. So um, the paper from Kurt Lin in 2017 showed that um, MCAV was even higher at rest than uh, during exercise itself. So I think we need to figure out uh, and take this into consideration. Um, first, think about the best shear stress response and then um, investigate which actually uh, leads to the overall highest uh, shear stress response. Great, thanks. I think that since it's almost uh, 11.45, we'll stop there, but I see if uh, there are a few questions, but we'll stick around a few minutes if you want to uh, to stay around and we chat directly with the, the speakers. So again, thank you very much for your, your, your virtual presence. We were really excited. So we hope that we, you enjoyed the seminar and um, do not forget to register for the next one, which will be in two weeks. So again, thank you very much and see you soon.